Welcome to Click Connect. I'm your host, Craig Sullivan. Today, we're doing part one of at least a two-part series in reference to Prop 13 and the gutting thereof. Um, we've got, you know, Eric Paulson is our resident expert in all things commercial other than hospitality. And he is uh, currently the Southern California and Arizona president of Kidder Matthews. He is also the incoming president of NAOP and brings a world of expertise to commercial real estate. And with, we've got ah, the ACA 13, we've got uh, the Taxpayer Protection Act uh, and a upland loophole that we want to discuss first. But before we do that, let me bring out Eric Paulson. Eric, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to have you back again. Thank you, my friend. It's always my pleasure, Craig. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. Hopefully I'll be as illuminating as you've described me. Uh, you're the best. That's why I always go to you. Come on. You know, you're, you're, a, you're a wonderful human being. You've got the knowledge, you've got more knowledge than any 20 other people in commercial real estate, and you get deals closed, okay? So, uh, and congratulations on being the uh, next president of NAOP. Um, now, as I recall, that's 20,000 members in that group? Am I uh, right on Globally, that? yes. If you globally. Will. So it's, an, it's a nationwide organization. We have about 1,200 members. We are the second largest chapter. So it's Naop SoCal encompassing Los Angeles and Orange County. Uh, there we but yes, uh, I've, I've learned the rule that it's three steps backwards now, not just two. So yes, I'll be the incoming <laughs> president. Actually, I'm looking forward to it. It's a great group of people. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun next year. So it's all good. All good. Yeah, it is. And you guys have some great events as well. So, um, you know, if you're moving into that space in commercial real estate, you should definitely check out Naop and join. Yep. Um, you know, Eric, I'd like you to give the audience, with your expertise, an overview of uh, you know this Upland Loophole, Taxpayer Protection Act, and ACA 13, and then we'll jump into the questions, and let's start out with the Upland Loophole, please. Sure. Let me, let me give you a little credibility background check, too. So NAOP sure. is one of the organizations that's heavily involved in legislative affairs. We have a PAC. We have our committees that are focused on all these. So... We've also got folks sitting up in Sacramento and are made aware of the legislation as it comes out. And I think I've mentioned this in the past uh, event with you where there's probably 3,000 bills that come out every year and 300 of them are directly related to commercial real estate. 10 of them are devastating to our industry and we oftentimes are fighting those or trying to mitigate them or come up with something to uh, at least make it more palatable or an alternative. So the topics we're talking about today, the Upland Loophole, the TPA, and the ACA 13. So it all starts with the Upland Loophole. And the Upland Loophole was basically, you're going to love this, it was uh, a cannabis case. So the California Cannabis Coalition uh, filed a lawsuit against the city of Upland and was basically saying uh, uh, it, was, it, it was decided, but it was really one where what they're trying to determine is that there is a legal distinction between the tax measures that are proposed by a government body, like a school board or a city council or something like that, and a tax measure put on the ballot by a citizen's initiative. And that's where this is gonna come in, citizen's initiative. So the Upland loophole was actually decided upon by the courts, and what it allows to do is citizen's initiatives can get on the ballot, and since it's a citizen's initiative, it's really a majority plus one. So it's 50% plus one. Most of our government-based tax laws that come into place that go to the voters to go before a voter has to be two thirds. So this kind of is a little back door of uh, our constitution that's here in California saying any taxes have to be two thirds. We voted on it. We said two thirds going forward. The upland loophole came in and said, well, unless it, if it's a citizen's initiative, you don't need the two thirds. It can be 50 plus one. And the courts back that up. So we now have a problem where just about any citizens can go put an initiative in place, get the people to sign off on it, and it becomes the, a way to kind of backdoor the situation. So a government may be backing it, but they'll do it through a citizen, and now you've got a 50 plus one, which means any taxes you want to put on somebody is now 50 plus one instead of a two-thirds vote, which seems like on its own 
seems like it might be okay. But remember, they're going after Prop 13, which is our tax protection on our homes, on our, on our commercial buildings. By doing this, they'll eventually be able to nibble away at and eliminate Prop 13. And that is the goal at the end of the day. We can't be confused with this. Even with the split rule that came out last year that says we're just doing commercial, they all said, yeah, commercial today, residential tomorrow. This is a direct assault on uh, Prop 13, disguised as a citizen's initiative. And unfortunately, the courts have backed it up. And that's where you're now seeing these two other proposals come out, TPA and ACA 13. So Upland decision was California Cannabis Coalition versus the city. It determined that you can do a citizen's initiative and it pretty much eliminates the two thirds vote for all special taxes initiated, uh, which is problematic. Absolutely. And uh, you see, you see and, and I don't think people are realizing that, you know, not only is this going to affect business and, you know, it's going to affect you as a consumer and individual, your real estate taxes on your home and the ability to erase inheriting it from a family member, uh, parent to child, things of that nature. All of a sudden, these tax bases just jump. Now, I still don't know, you know, because we've we've got you know, we've got two percent by law with with Prop Thirteen. If an area is reassessed, if a house is or or a building, an office building, a, a hotel, anything is sold, it's reassessed on the market value of the sale, you get a supplemental bill. Right. Now, I don't know how many of these supplemental bills, especially if you've got something that's the flavor of the month, let's say like how multifamily and um, uh, some retail outlets, you know, all of a sudden they've traded a couple of times within a year and all of a sudden, you're the last owner, and you're getting hit with two supplemental bills. One of them's yours. The other one's for the prior owner. So now you've got to go back, get that removed from the secured roll, put on the unsecured roll. Have they been following up? How much of that is sitting out in an unsecured tax lane on a prior owner that has not been recovered? Um, yeah. Last time I checked with a city up north that I will not name, they were over 12 months behind. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that's not surprising. That's not surprising. And no. Let me let me also embellish on a point no. that you made that I think is important. When you turn around and say, I'm a I'm a, an apartment renter. I yeah. don't own a house. I don't own a shopping center. I don't own the apartment building I'm renting in. Right. It doesn't matter. It all gets passed down to the consumer. Uh, so yes. at the end of the day, even though you think you're just a renter or just a citizen, all of our bills are going to go up. It's a it's a tax. At the end yeah. of the day, it's just a tax on us, no matter what we it, do. It is. And, you know, I, 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 my problem being is there's no accountability. There's no transparency as well. Oh, yeah. Um, what are they spending and, on, right? Right. Where's, where's the money going? Yeah. Okay. I, I think we can all agree in today's political climate that we don't like taxes. Okay. But you've also got to have a fair, balanced system of transparency, collection, assessment, it all runs together. And, you know. Well, you just got to look at the budget, Craig. It's only this yeah. thick. It's right yeah. there. Just yeah. look at this. this yeah, it's right there. It's right, right there. Yeah. But the, the, the problem also that comes into play with the upland loophole with everything going on is it's really, think about a special interest. You name it whether it's a union, labor, police, fire, whether it's teacher, whether it's uh, name some organization that's even undesirable, they can go put a tax bill on there that will benefit them. Right. So a special interest group can come in and say, hey, and this is, they tried this in Los Angeles. If you remember they, uh, the teachers uh, union yep. put out that it was gonna be 13 cents a square foot on industrial buildings and the money was going to go to improve our schools. Now it's going into the pension funds, but it's gonna improve right. our schools. Right. So with something like this, an individual group with enough support can put a tax into our tax roll and the money doesn't go to the government per se, but goes to that special interest group. So why would we want to have something in there where enough people can say, look, I want to put this on the bill. I'm going to get 50 plus one. I'm going to cram the box with my voters because it's going to benefit just them. 
And next yeah. thing you know, we've got these taxes coming on all of us that are going to support only a, a, a smaller number than all of us. So that's really, I think, at the end of the day, what really bothers me is, is that groups can come in and throw a tax on there that will directly benefit them. And it's not really the purpose of taxes. In my it, it's opinion. not. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, part of the other problem is that Okay, you and I were having a conversation before we started taping. Um, we're looking at a dollar twelve being added to gasoline sales per gallon, you know, tax and fees. Okay, right. um, you know, again, where's this money going? Okay, yeah. how how did we get that? Right. Um, well, we voted. We we voted it on ourselves. A lot of the sales taxes on gasoline that we voted on went to to right. do road improvements. Right. I said, you know what? You're right. I'll pay another fifty cents a gallon to improve the freeways, which suck, or any of the other infrastructure. And so, when you're driving along, you see the construction the sign that says your taxpayers, your tax dollars hard at work. A lot of that is there. Um, what I find funny is is that uh, I believe our governor came out and said only eighty nine cents a gallon are taxes that we've that we've put on there. I was just in Wisconsin. Gas was four bucks a gallon. It's seven bucks a gallon out here. Yeah. That's that's a three dollar differential for me. Yeah. I don't know where the 89 cents comes in, but we're yeah. paying a lot more uh in gas out here because it's been self-imposed. All yeah. right, do we now want to say 50 plus one and we can throw more on there? It just it seems problematic to me. Let's let me just say it that way. Yeah, it it, it <laughs> is problematic. And you know it's um you know, this, this assault on Proposition 13, Prop 19. Um, 218, all of them. Yeah. Um, you know, that's going to affect everybody. Correct. Everybody. Correct. Okay. Your ability to leave a piece of real estate for your child or children um, or your, your spouse, whatever it may be. Um, you know, you're, well, even you're, on a transfer, even yeah. I bought, I bought this property from you yesterday and I knew my tax bill was going to be X 1% of my purchase right. price, 2% increase a year, some yep. supplemental assessments on there for vector control and, you know, mellow ruse or anything like that. I knew what my underwriting was Yeah. next year. You turn around and tell me, well, now we're going to mark to a market that you don't control. That's subjective. That is based on somebody without necessarily real estate experience is not, uh, is, is overworked. Now I have to go sue back or go appeal or do whatever. It just, it's a nice, easy way to say your tax is going to be X when you buy it. It's going to increase this much per year at most. Yeah. I can underwrite that. And then right. I can pass that along through my, my budget to whomever are my end users. But having that unknown is, is going to be problematic. So to me, the other part I found is, is that if you follow the money, where's the money going? We mentioned how is it getting spent? Yeah. There are a lot of special interest groups that are backing these these taxes because the money's going to go to them. And it's sad because you'll you'll see the proposals that comes out in your ballot and the triple quadruple negatives that mean, well, if you vote for this, it means you're not doing this, but around through this, or you're gonna do this. And it's so confusing. Everybody goes, Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, sounds good. So yeah. it's just it just seems like it's a lot of smoke and mirrors for money that's going to go to a special interest group or something that's not going to go to the benefit of all of us, and they've made it easier to do that. You know, and and I really don't want to fund an organization's unfunded liabilities. Yeah, you know, yeah, I can understand that. You know, and that's personal taste. I mean, for those yeah. who are in that and looking for the pension fund, I get it. My father is a, a an ex school teacher. He's he's on yeah. the pension, if you will, and um. It, it's one where that's his fixed income though. So yeah. yeah, he's for it because he's got it coming into his pension, but he's against it because now he loses his house. It's like, which Apple are you going to bite from? Yeah. There you or go. Bitten by. There you go. I, yeah. you know, if you've got a piece of property, it's been in the same family for 50 years. They bought it in 73. They right. can afford it. They, they yeah. bought it for a hundred grand. It's now worth 2 million. It goes yeah. to 2 million. Someone's else is going to have to buy it, but there's a lot of those homes that will go do that. Next yeah. thing you know, you now have that supply. What's it worth to you with who knows what the taxes that have increased is? You've actually made housing more unaffordable. Exactly. Uh, when, you, when you end up thinking about it. 
Now, but, but, but let's go back to our original point. I apologize for, well, for taking Well, before we go here. back to our original point, let's throw a little bit more gasoline on that fire. Can you, can <laughs> you, can you see what's going to happen with every lender with your tax impounds? And all of a sudden, that statement's coming out to you in the middle of the year. Hey, we got a deficit. You can either have your payment go up to this or right. you can... Make a payment of this to cover what we think that shortfall is. Sure. So, sure. I, you know, not thought out well by the proponents of, that are launching this attack. And producer Danny's going to drop in a, a couple of pictures. We've got some headlines from uh, the San Diego Register and from uh, the, I'm sorry, the OC Register and the San Diego Times in reference to this. And I will have links for both those articles in our uh, description below. But uh, what else do you want to touch on with uh, the, the loophole? Well, Eric? I think that, that covers it. I mean, it really is the, an ability for a citizen's vote to go take place that you yeah. now throw taxes on something. So it was the catalyst for a, oh, no, this is their backdoor assault for uh, against Prop 13, Prop 218. So the countermeasure was something called the Taxpayer Protection Act. Yeah. And the Taxpayer, the taxpayer Protection Act. I'm just going to call it TPA going forward. So I don't yeah, please. stumble or Please, I can't do it either. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> TPA made it to the ballot next November. So that's the November 5th ballot. Right. So the idea behind TPA is it's going to close the loophole. It's basically going to keep it at two-thirds. It's really a, a, a form of long-term protection against excessive taxes, state and local level control, um, anything that you go for taxes has to be on a two thirds vote. It's placed on the ballot. Um, uh, it kind of eliminates that. Uh, the idea is, is that it'll protect you from some of these citizens initiatives that were at 50 plus one. It'll make them go to two thirds. So anything, anybody trying to pass new and higher taxes, it's going to have a two thirds vote of the people. Right. So that's the idea. And so supporting this, obviously, you mentioned Jarvis earlier, yeah. uh, California Business Property Association, California Business Roundtable. There's a whole bunch of chairs on this. NAOP California is is involved in this. Uh, I believe the residential size with it. CAR um, are, are for the Taxpayer Protection Act as well, because it really impacts a lot of the commercial real estate um, folks. Yeah. So that's what that's what the TPA is. So the TPA comes out. And then next thing you know, uh, a lawsuit gets filed. They file a lawsuit in September uh, against TPA in an attempt yeah. to have it pulled off the statewide ballot. So who would you – let's 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 play a little game, Craig, because I know you <laughs> love games. Who do you love think it. were the petitioners in this lawsuit? Who do you think filed the lawsuit against the TPA? I, Off the top of my head, I am going to say – special interest groups and uh, labor, labor unions that uh, okay. uh, found this uh, unpleasant to them because they see the raising of the property taxes as being their personal piggy banks. Perfect. I'm going to, I'm going to say indirectly, you're correct. Correctly though, is, is their figureheads in the government who are representing them. So the, the petitioners of this lawsuit were the legislature of the state of California. Oh my God. Governor Gavin Newsom. And a gentleman by the name of John Burton. John Burton did it on behalf of the California Democratic Party. Those are your, those are your petitioners. Our governor, the legislature, and the Democratic Party. That's who is fighting TPA. So they're fighting for the ability to throw more taxes uh, the, and make it easier to put more taxes on you. So that lawsuit was filed. Um, I've not heard if there's a success to that yet because obviously it was only September. Yeah. Um, but really, the strategy is to target TPA, and again, that's dismantling Prop 13 and 218. So, uh, and it'll make it difficult to fix. It will make it difficult to fix if they pass it. So, the idea is, is you want to vote for the Taxpayer Protection Act. Now, lawsuits one way to fight it. The other way to fight it is a counter ballot and a countermeasure. And that's where the ACA 13 comes in. So, ACA 13 is was introduced down in San Diego by. Yep. Uh, Christopher Ward uh, is Democrat down there. Uh, and the idea is it's a, both of these are constitutional. Well, this one, ACA for sure is a constitutional amendment. Taxpayer Protection Act is protecting against the citizens initiatives. But they want to do a constitutional amendment, ACA 13, that will allow 
taxes to be voted on it at 50% plus one. So it's meant to codify that loophole from Upland. So it's basically to put it in the code and say, this is, uh, this is now the code and now you have 50 plus one for additional taxes. Something that we put in place back in the 70s to try and avoid. So it's going to overturn the abilities like Prop 13 and others that have um, two thirds vote to a simple majority. So 50% plus one vote. Plus one, yeah. So they were trying to put it in this November's election. So it was going to go in this November's election to preempt the taxpayer, the TPA. And yeah. instead, uh, Ward left it on his desk through a certain time period. So now it's on the ballot for next year. So you're going to have head to head ballots. My kind of cynical view is they didn't put it on this ballot because I think next year's presidential election and everything going on, it would have impacted that. If it was, if it was passed I this year, I think yeah. they'd have, they'd have had ammunition against the democratic presidential nominee or whomever they wanted to go after the democratic party, whatever Democrat supported this and didn't want to do that before the big election next year. That's my cynical view because I think it would have had an impact there. But I don't think that's cynical at all. I think you're absolutely right on target with that. And this is the problem with the super majority. I mean, you know, the Republicans had a super majority way back when, and people got fed up and they got voted out. And, you know, the Democrats have had a super majority and people are getting extremely fed up. And monkeying around with the third rail, which is taxes and forcing people to leave California is not a good thing. Um, you and I both saw that study. Matter of fact, you sent it to me about, the, you know, they weren't worried about the brain drain in California because we've got new startups and everything else coming in. Um, right. San Francisco's betting heavily on AI. They've got two, eight of the top 10 AI firms are based in San Francisco and renting up office space. Um, how, how much farther do you think that rental scenario is going to go with taxes going through the roof? I, I think it'll continue. I think it'll, it'll continue to rise. Uh, I think you're going to see continued more and more of that. And yes, the report you, mes you mentioned was done by the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, which basically said, yes, we are seeing large companies leave, those large companies are leaving because of cost and expenses, but they're now established. Incoming are these startups and things of that nature, which need all of the intelligence, the, the higher education, uh, what Silicon Valley brings to the table to help them get to a point where they're now not dependent upon California and can move out too. So you're seeing the brain coming in, but you're seeing the labor, uh, the larger companies uh, going out for, for cheaper labor. Will that continue? Yep. Most likely. Uh, it still seems like we're becoming more and more business unfriendly. A lot of what you're seeing is climate related taxes and amendments and rules and regulations, which are um, really impacting uh, the ability to do business here. Uh, they keep saying that industrial buildings are the, are the big monster out there creating all kinds of issues. Uh, but I still want my one hour delivery. So I, I just think you, you, you mentioned the people, the people are going to get upset. The people are going to rebel. I think my problem is, is the people who are actually voting have their hands out and appreciate the fact that money is coming from somebody else and going to them without really digging down deep enough to realize that their Starbucks coffee went from three bucks to 10 bucks or that their rent went from a thousand to 1300 or whatever they went to the grocery store just went up by 15% because you're blaming inflation. Inflation is a part of it, but it's also all of the uh, legislation that we're putting on top of that that's helping it. So I just worry, yeah, we have the pendulum swinging, but I just worry that um, there are enough people who are saying I'm getting something for free or I'm getting it covered for me that they, they vote for this without looking at the longer term impacts on all that. Um, so, yeah, I, I just worry that. Yeah, there is some rebellion. Yes, you are getting tired yeah. of, it, of it. But, you know, we've got some interesting city councils in all of our, our downtown areas where the corruption you've seen, our second city council up in L.A. get arrested. You've seen all this. Going. Everybody's complaining. Look at how they're turning our downtown areas into crap with the homeless, the crime and all that. Yeah. <laughs> you voted for the city council member, right? You're yeah. voting for these people. Uh, you're not recalling. You voted for Gascon. You voted for 
breed. You voted for this, and yet you're turning around saying they're doing a crappy job. But hey, you're not doing anything about it. So it's kind of like we're shooting ourselves in the foot. So I just get worried when we say the people are finally going to rebel when the people haven't done squat so far yet and have not exercised their right to vote enough to mm-hmm. to, to make the change that's that's necessary. So we'll see. We'll see. I'm I'm yeah, uh, I- a little cynical when it comes to some of this. Yeah, I well, you know, past history, recent past history proves you right on that, my friend. Hey, Eric, <laughs> this has been great. We're going to take a pause, and this is going to be the end of part one. Eric will be rejoining us for part two. I would like to thank all of our uh, audience for, for being here today. I also want to thank producer Danny for the outstanding job she's doing, and I also would like to thank Red Roof Franchising for uh, sponsoring this episode and the follow-up episode. If you've noticed, we are doing some themed multi-part episodes. We've got a lot of topics coming up. Red Roof is making this possible, and i really like to thank them again for that. Call Matt Hostedler over there. He'd be glad to help you. Let him know that producer Danny and I sent you. Also, March 6th and 7th, 2024, the seventh annual California Lodging Investment Conference. You know what? You can meet Eric Paulson there. It's probably his birthday that week, too. So uh, join us. You can register at our website, cliconference.com, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. We've got our hotel development deal of the year. Uh, You can submit your property for that. And also, we are bringing back our lifetime achievement. Can't talk about that too much right now, but we'll be making an announcement. Also, you can catch me on California Craig, Three Minute Thursdays with Glenn Hausman, and Friday Night Audit with Glenn Hausman and producer David. But we'll be back with part two. Thank you. Thank you.